Okay, cool. I'll make sure this is pointed at me because I have a tendency to bounce around. Hello, everybody. Thank you for sitting so patiently. Uh, my name is Mark Mandel. I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform, um, which means I get to do a lot of silly stuff with thousands of servers and they pay me for it because, I don't know, reasons. Apparently, I'm entertaining or something. Um, I mentioned it just before, but I'll say it again. Um, my business cards are up front along with a bunch of stickers. If at any point in time you realize that you had a question that you didn't ask in the session, make sure you grab a card so you can send me an email. Bug me on Twitter, DMs are open, etc., etc. More than happy to talk about this stuff ad nauseum. That's all fun. Cool. So enough about me. Let's talk about you, the four of you in this room. Oh, this will be fun. Then we can make this kind of interactive and it's cool. Uh, so, okay, I asked the question about who's technical. People who work on multiplayer games. Sweet. People who want to work on multiplayer games. That was a pretty good 50-50 split. All right, straight. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, so that means you're all the people I want to talk to, which is lovely. All right. So what I want to talk to you today is about how I'm a terrible game designer and artist, um, but I like building infrastructure for games. Uh, I made this really stupid game called Paddle Soccer uh, that is basically two players that play soccer online. Um, it's a session-based multiplayer game. Uh, I built it using Unity, uh, and it's basically sort of my demo and the thing I'm going to talk to you about and explain the concepts of which that I'm going to explain uh, in this talk. Um, the only special thing about this game is that it uses an authoritative server. People are familiar with what I mean with authoritative server? Somewhat? Okay, that's cool, that's fine. So, like, just so we're all on the same page, essentially you have a series of clients that talk to a dedicated server that lives somewhere in the cloud or on the internet. It is the source of truth, uh, because people are horrible and they cheat, and that sucks. Um, and so that, basically I like to think of it as, as uh, they send their inputs generally and some other information potentially down to the dedicated game server, and the dedicated game server sends that information back about what's true. I like to think of it as the clients ask, like these are the things I would like to have happen, uh, and the dedicated game server tells, this is the source of truth and this is the thing that's actually happening. Um, for interest sake, if you're interested in any of this stuff, uh, this is built, and I'll give you all the source code at the end, it's on GitHub. It's built using the high level APIs for Unity for doing their multiplayer stuff. Uh, it's okay, meh, does the job. Uh, and the other fun thing that it does uh, if you actually play with Unity, is one thing that you can do, which is a little small to see, uh, is you can build Linux headless builds to basically generate dedicated game servers with Unity. Again, it's not bad. Uh, there's a little checkbox there in that little tiny thing that says headless mode, and headless builds are nice because they don't need a display or a GPU, and you can run them on Linux servers, and so you can actually run them as dedicated game servers. And it works pretty sweet. Uh, it's not the best documented thing in the world, but uh, if you ever feel like doing that and you get stuck, feel free to ping me or either that or look at my sample code. All right, cool. So um, let's talk about infrastructure stuff because that's, that's what we're here for and that's the fun side of things. So this may look familiar to you. This is kind of like what a traditional backend for a multiplayer game that is sort of session-based looks like. Uh, you might have two or more clients. That green highlight doesn't show up at all, that's fine. So you might have two or more uh, Clients that end up connecting to some kind of matchmaker. So a matchmaker puts people together, uh, maybe by skill, maybe just randomly, depends on what you're doing. That matchmaker will then talk to some kind of server manager, right? So something that's going to talk to a cluster of machines and thereby say to that cluster of machines, hey, cluster of machines, I would really like a dedicated game server that runs on one of you, uh, and I would like to have set it up so that two players can play a game on it. Uh, and then it usually grabs the IP and port, sends that back up the pipe, sends that all the way up to those clients. Those two clients connect to the same machine, and ergo, we're now playing Overwatch. Cool? All right, sweet. That's base level stuff. This is pretty much what most of the games look like when you're doing session-based stuff. Um, your MMOs work slightly differently, but if you're like you're talking your Overwatches and your annual tournaments and those sort of fun games, that's your basic just. Cool? Sweet, I'm seeing nods, good. I only have four people I need to look at, it's perfect. All right, so how do we build this in a way that's gonna scale and in a way that, that makes sense and means that we don't have to build a lot of this ourselves, right? There's a lot of work that would need to go into something like this. So, who's familiar with this whale thing? One of you, perfect, you're in exactly the right talk. All right, fantastic. So Docker is a really cool, um, open source project that's been around for several years now and has definitely picked up a lot of steam and in the infrastructure side of things. Um, Docker is kind of amazing in that 
it enables us to have uh, a virtualized environment, essentially, that contains artifacts that basically we're able to put stuff in and then use. So I'll, I'll explain sort of to a degree what that means. So we were talking a little bit about, uh, say, the Unity dedicated game server that I was talking about. So what I'm able to do, and I'll look through the steps in a minute, but essentially I'm able to take the binaries that come from this Unity dedicated game server and I put it inside a container. We're going to talk about how we do that. And this is really cool because it becomes a standard for our software. So if you've ever written like either something in Unity or maybe something in Java or something in Node, often when it comes to, hey, I want to scale this thing, you're like, oh, I would like to scale this Node program. I'm going to Google how to scale this Node program or how to scale this Java program. Instead, what this gives us is this standard of how to run software and how to deploy software and how to execute and push new things about software in a standard way, regardless of what's inside it. Right? So much like the shipping container says that I don't care whether you put a Ferrari in there or it's a bunch of chairs or like, I don't know, water bottles, doesn't matter. Right? I can pick it up with a standard crane, I can put it on a standard boat, it can sh ship it around the world in a standard way. I can do very similar things with, with, with this kind of software. And that gets me really, really excited. Because not only does it mean that you have standard ways of running things, uh, it means you can then build projects on top of that that do very standard solutions to very common software problems, right? Regardless of whether you're running like a WordPress site or dedicated game servers, you still need to do log aggregation. You still need to, hey, I have a new version and I want to push this up. Or, hey, I want to send this up and make sure it doesn't go down when I'm updating the new version. Things like that are very common problems we all have. Um, so it lets us do, do nice things in that way, which is pretty awesome. So what does that look like? Let's actually look at some code and have a play. Uh, first step is very much um, this file. It's called a Docker file. Uh, it's uh, what's it called? procedural, starts on the top, goes to the bottom. This is basically how we create an artifact. Um, you start with a from line, which is like your base image. Like, where do I want to start from? What operating system do I want to start from? Or maybe there's a pre-built thing that I want to go from. Here, I'm just starting from Ubuntu. It's, Ubuntu's nice. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we can do here, but the very basic thing is, okay, so I've created that um, the dedicated game server. I tarred it up into an archive. Uh, I stuck it in a folder, so I just copy that into my image. Right? So when I build with this Docker file, I'm like, cool, throw this tar file in there, and then please untar it. And so cool, now it's in my Docker image as I'm building it. And then I finally say at the end, when this thing runs that I'm building, which is a Docker image, I want it to run this server binary, uh, and that log file means that I'm going to spit that out to standard out, which is the standard way of doing logging in, in Docker. And that's really it. So from here, I'm able to build this standalone artifact from this thing. It means that I can write this Docker file, and here's the, here's the pretty picture. So I can write this Docker file, I can say Docker build, here's the thing, and it gives me an image. That image is something that I can pass around. Right? So I can send that up into a repository, um, once I've given it a tag, so gcr.io is the Google Cloud repository. You could use us, you could use Quay, there's a bunch of different ones. Docker Hub has one. Um, and this is also a nice thing, right? How do I know that the binary that you're running is actually the binary that should be running? Uh, did somebody man in the middle attack it? Did somebody make sure it's hashed? Is all that kind of stuff. Um, I can say, oh, these repositories, they have securities, they already have those bindings in place, they have auth in place. I can make sure only the people who are supposed to have access are only going to have access. So I can create my image, I can push it up to my repository, maybe I have an automated process that does that, uh, which is always quite nice. And then this image is able to be put in this repository and then shared out from there, right? Um, I can, my processes can start it, or maybe you're sitting there working on something and then you want to have access to the same image, you just pull down the image and you're working on the same thing. And that's super powerful and super cool. So let's, let's see this actually working. Oop. Uh, what did I want? I want to actually want this one. So um, here we have my server. This is going to look really boring, but so I can spin up my server, and you can see it runs, and there's a bunch of output and all that kind of stuff. That's that's the ordinary boring version. Now let's see. Uh, nope, that's not what I want. Um, excuse me. There we go. Yeah. You doing this over my over my shoulder is always fun. Unity, that's what I want. Thank you. So this is kind of cool. We're gonna see exactly the same thing, but this is a Docker image that I got running from before, and it is gonna run exactly the same thing. But this is actually kind of exciting because I wrote Docker Run, 
I didn't run the binary. I didn't specify a runtime. I didn't do anything like that. It doesn't matter what the software it is that I'm running. My input is always Docker run. If I'm doing this through an API, maybe to connect to this thing, for, which we'll look at kind of a little bit later, it's always Docker run. It doesn't matter what I put inside it, which is hugely, hugely powerful. Because now it doesn't matter what's inside my container, which is really nice. Cool. So like Docker, containers, good. Nodding of heads. Excellent. Perfect. OK. So let's talk about the next fun bit. Right? You're like, cool, we have this Docker container. <laughs> but like, we only have four people playing. That's fine. What happens if we have lots of people playing? Right? This becomes a bigger problem, right? Just because we have a container doesn't mean that this thing is going to scale over hundreds of machines or scale out to millions of players or anything like that, right? That's not anything that has solved that problem. Cool. So here we get into this funny thing called Kubernetes. Okay, so Kubernetes apparently is Greek for Helmsman. That's what I've been told. I actually don't speak Greek. I have no idea. Uh, Kubernetes is a really cool project. Kubernetes is literally exactly what we're talking about. It is a generic solution that sits on top of containers for scaling things across hundreds of machines. Why is it cool as well? It's cool because it's open source, which means you can run it anywhere. Uh, you can run it on us. You can run it on AWS. You can run it on DigitalOcean. You can run it on your own machines. Doesn't really matter, right? And it's re like it, I get super, super excited about this because it's a massive ecosystem supported by very large enterprise companies run by both game companies and companies like Target and eBay and GitHub, um, who here has used GitHub. Good. Okay. You've used Kubernetes. Well done. Uh, anyone play Pokemon Go? Yep. Get it. Kubernetes. Right. So it's actually underlying a lot of really big systems. So it's got, it's got a lot of... Uh, real credibility in terms of who's been using it and for what sort of scale loads, which is really nice. Uh, but it's also the acceleration of the community has been really, really amazing. So what I'm going to talk to you about is basically how we can use this for running dedicated game servers. Um, but one thing I'll talk about first as well, because we sort of put this in front of us just now, it's never just dedicated game servers, right? It's never just that. There's always other services that come along with it when you're making your game. Uh, so in this instance, we have a matchmaker that we also want to run. And the things that I like about this whole thing with Kubernetes um, and running game servers on it is that you can run all your other services on it as well. So I would say traditionally, you normally have sort of two disparate systems between like what runs all like your auth and your marketplace and your inventory management and like who is friends with whom and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got your system that runs your dedicated game servers and they kind of run differently or there's different systems built by different people that do different stuff. Here you can say, okay, cool, I actually don't care. I mean, the way it kind of works inside Kubernetes, and we'll look at that, is a bit different, but the underlying infrastructure and the tools that you use and the ecosystem of things that you have can necessarily be the same for both. And I think that's hugely powerful as well. So what I'm gonna do quickly, just to give you a very low baseline, this is sort of doing some stuff on Kubernetes, is I am gonna deploy the matchmaker uh, for this thing. And by the time we're done at this talk, we should have a working game that we can play online, which would be cool too. So. The matchmaker part um, is just a basic HTTP matchmaker that's really silly um, and is kind of the workload that Kubernetes was aimed at in the originally, but um, we'll look at how we can make it do some other cool things. So the nice thing about Kubernetes as well is that it's declarative. So we basically tell it what we want and then trust it to do the thing that we want it to do. Uh, in this instance, we're saying, okay, on this cluster of machines, I've actually got a three node cluster. Actually, it's more than that. I think it's about four. Um, wherein we want to say, all right, I want five instances of this matchmaker. That seems like a good number. Kubernetes, please do that for me. And I'm going to send this YAML file up to make this happen. Um, I can do this through APIs. I can do this through a couple of different ways, but the YAML is kind of the nice way of looking at it. Um, and so if I want five of these, which ones do I want? I want one of the particular Docker images we were looking at before. Um, I can pass through some extra stuff. I can be like, here's some environment variables, such as where's Redis. Um, I can tell it what ports I want to open. Uh, here it's case 8080. But this is really all I need. I can send this YAML file up to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is going to go, oh, OK, cool. You want that image. Sweet. And you want five instances of it. Awesome. I will make sure that happens. And if one of them happens to fall over because, I don't know, one of us writes buggy code or you know, all sorts of weird stuff can happen, something gets struck by lightning, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to create a whole new one again. And I'm going to handle that kind of stuff for you because that's the sort of stuff that we all have to deal with. Right? Software fails. 
uh, we need that kind of that kind of uh, capabilities within our system. So that's cool. We've got five of those. Uh, one thing you might see up here on the top right, one well, your yes, your top right. I had to think about that for a sec. Uh, you have these labels. These are arbitrary key value pairs that will become really important in just a sec. So here we're just applying role matchmaker server. That's just this arbitrary key value pair. So why is that actually important? That's important because, as I just said to you, if we send this up to Kubernetes, we have five instances of this running inside our cluster. But who knows where it's running? Right? We don't know. Kubernetes knows. But we need to be able to interact with them. We need to be able to send messages to them. We need to, be able to do stuff to them. So Kubernetes has a fun thing called a service. Services are sweet. They're a load balancer. People know what I mean by load balancer? Yeah? OK. So basically, static port, information goes in. Oh, sorry, static IP address doesn't change. Information goes in, and its job is to route the information, usually in a round robin fashion, to each of the containers that are sitting behind it. So you have a static place to send stuff. Right? You don't have to worry about either, either uh, containers being ephemeral, like maybe they go down, maybe they come up. That's all handled for you. So how do you do this? You have a selector. Right? So we saw those arbitrary key value pairs. Those were there to say, oh, so now we can do stuff like I want a service, and I want to expose everything that has a role matchmaker server. This is quite a nice decoupling, actually. It means that there are multiple ways you can create containers inside Kubernetes, uh, but it means then that you can put services in front of them regardless of how you happen to create them. And we'll look at actually some other ways of doing that. And we can do fun things like, do we want this to be public facing? Do we just want it to be exposed inside Kubernetes? Uh, here I say type load balancer. So if you pass this up to a cloud provider such as ourselves, we'll create a network load balancer for you. Um, if you're running it on your own machines, you can do some other stuff. It's called node ports. Um, you can expose it your own way that way. Or you could drop this off entirely, and then it's only exposed internally, if that's the sort of thing that you want. And there's all sorts of other fun and interesting network configuration things that we're not even remotely going to talk about today, because we don't have time. So I mean, that's kind of the stuff that we need to run a matchmaker. So shall we do it? Does that sound like fun? Hopefully, nothing goes wrong. Sweet. So uh, up the top here, I have a really nice um, visualization called Weavescope. Uh, it's an open source tool that you can install on any Kubernetes cluster. It's just a really pretty visualization of what's happening inside your cluster. So I've got some make commands just to make my life really easy uh, so that I don't remember how to do it. So you'll notice there's a kubectl create dash f. All right, that's the actual command we want to do. That's, that's how I pass things up to Kubernetes itself. I could also be doing this through an API, that kind of stuff. I'm going to be a little hand wavy about how I installed Redis. I'm not going to worry about that too much right now. Um, we can look at that later. But there's an instance of Redis running inside a container right there. Actually, that's a decent enough size, so that's good. Sweet. Um, what I am going to do then instead now is make deploy. All right, so I'm going to deploy, create, send that deployment. So we should get five instances of that matchmaker up and running in just a sec. There we go. Now, Weavescope's actually kind of cool in that it introspects the network traffic. So that's why we get pretty lines that say that things are actually talking to each other, which is super sweet. There we go. So we got a whole bunch of them. Cool. And so there's five of them, and that's not laid out in the best way, but that's fine. We're also going to need that service that we were talking about before. What is this thing doing? Thank you. That's going to show up in a whole different window um, if you're actually interested. So here we have a service. Ooh, and it's got five pods behind it, and it's talking to Redis. Uh, we can do other fun stuff here, too, while that's firing up in the background. I'm actually going to. Um, here we go. So we can even do, uh, where are we, scale deployment. We'll make it seven matchmaker. If we were like, hey, I would like to like seven of these, that would be a much better number. Uh, please do that for me. I can do that kind of stuff. There's also auto scaling stuff in here and other fun things and whatnot. Um, there's all sorts of fun things you can do, but that just makes a really cool demo. So I will actually scale that back down to three because we'll worry about that later. OK, cool. So that's all running in the background. So cool. I have a matchmaker. Any questions on that so far? Just basic stuff, but that's cool. All right, sweet. All right, so we've got a very basic HTTP-based stuff. Let's talk about the fun thing, what you all came here for, I'm guessing. Um, dedicated game servers. 
these are a little different. We don't want to put load balancers in front of those because that's extra latency, that's bad. Also, it's all sorts of issues with like who's playing what game, doing round robin stuff, Ugh, no. What we want to do instead is have this server manager part fire up a game server and then have a, a um, IP import that we can connect to directly, right? We want to be able to say, this is always connecting to this game because this matchmaker has put these two people together, right? And that's not what we've seen here so far. Now, what is really nice about Kubernetes is that while it does give us all that lovely stuff that we just saw around like deployments and services and whatnot, it also gives us the lower level pieces. So deployments actually sit on top of other constructs. Uh, in this case, the most basic of construct is what's called a pod. Uh, if for the um, entirety of this talk in your brain, pod equals container, you're fine. Uh, generally, pod can actually mean multiple containers, but we're not going to worry about that for now. So if I, if I say pod or container synonymously, we'll just leave it at that for now, and we can worry about it later. But a pod is basically your most basic building block. And so we can fire off just a pod and manage it ourselves. Um, if you have a look in the sample code that I have, that I'll have at the end on the GitHub, I actually do this through the API, but since we're um, doing YAML stuff today, it's a bit easy to just look at. But what do we do? So if we want a pod, you may have noticed that it says kind up the top, so kind pod, excellent. Um, Kubernetes comes with all sorts of useful things like, hey, generate me a unique name, so it'll create a pod with a unique name. And then much like we did before, uh, we just say, Pod, this is the image I want. This is my soccer server, right? My dedicated game server. That's cool. And then one piece of magic, and there's actually a couple of ways of doing this, but this is probably the simplest, is we have control over networking. So we say host network is true. So what we're actually saying here is when this container starts up, make sure you start on the same network as the machine that you're on. That way it means we can do direct connections really easily. Our network is super tight. There's no extra latency. Um, and Docker containers actually share kernels between the Linux machines, which is also really sweet. Um, so it works really, really well. Uh, we can open up ports within that container and they're available, as long as they're available through the firewall rules that you have in your, your place. Uh, we can connect directly to machines and then the port, whichever they happen to open up to. Um, there's some other cute stuff we're able to do here. Um, there's a restart policy. So containers, like I said, usually just restart whenever something fails or comes back down because that's their usual their usual mechanism. Uh, but for game servers, because we have state in memory, I kind of don't want to do that, because if you reconnect to a game that just restarted, bad things happen. I'd much rather manage that myself. So I set a re restart policy of never. Um, and I also pass through, there's a, there's a special sort of syntax called the downward API that I pass that name that gets generated through as an environment variable. So I can use that for later uh, to do some fun things. But yeah, I can run that. And that is going to create a pod inside my cluster regardless of how big my cluster is, right? And Kubernetes can currently support up to, I want to say it's 5,000 nodes off the top of my head, so a decent size. And what's also cool is this is means that uh, Kubernetes will take care of basically bin packing uh, the resources that I need to use across my cluster. This is what my apartment looked like when I first moved to San Francisco. If you've ever moved to San Francisco, places are small. I moved from Australia where I had a nice big house. These are all the boxes. This is my bin packing metaphor. That's it, that's really it. It's really just so I can show photos of a lot of boxes. Thankfully, my house doesn't look nearly that bad now, <laughs> but that was moving in day, and it took us a while to get through it, sorted through it. But um, yeah, so that Kubernetes will take care of that for us, which is great. Um, and there's also lots of uh, little hooks and configuration options and all sorts of stuff you can do if you really want as well for uh, having fine control over exactly what's going on. That clock's not right. Um, all right, sweet. Can I have it? That clock isn't right. Can someone tell me what time it is? Can someone tell me what time it is? The clock down here isn't right. 4.15. 4 all right, so I got half an hour. Perfect, perfect. Um, all right, sweet. So the next thing I want to talk about, um, so we have a pod. It's up and running. Um, the one thing Kubernetes won't do for you is select an open port. It's sort of not built into its thing. Uh, again, there's a few ways we can do this. I made it really boring and easy is I go around in a loop and I select a random port until I find one that opens, which works. That's fine. I just need to know what port it is. There's a few different ways you could do it. Um, and then what I do is I have a backend in which I can register that port against. This is just also a nice way of saying, hey, my server's ready for taking connections. Let's start a game now. Um, 
that registration is just a, I take a JSON packet, stick that session name with the name of the pod in it, uh, the port that I've been allocated or found, and I send it as an HTTP post. And that becomes a really nice hook. That just becomes a really nice hook for my entire system to say, hey, I found a port, it's open, I'm accepting connections, let me send you the information that is required. So what does that actually look like now that I've talked through all that code? So what that ends up looking like is you've got one player who connects to a matchmaker, right? Pretty normal stuff. Second player finally connects as well, and the matchmaker's like, cool, we've got two players to play this amazing game of paddle soccer. Matchmaker is going to talk to my server manager the server, and say, hey, I would, like a, I would like a game server, please. That server manager is going to say to Kubernetes, hey, create me a pod with this game server in it. That would be really sweet. I would really appreciate that. Kubernetes creates that pod with a dedicated game server inside it. Dedicated game server is going to say, oh, I found my port. Cool. I will now register myself with the server manager. Server manager is going to be like, oh, sweet. You've got a port. I know what IP address you're on because I know what node you're on because I can talk to Kubernetes and ask it because that's part of the API that it's got available for me. I can send that information back up the pipe uh, to the matchmaker, back up to both clients, and away we go. I can now play a game. Cool? Let's see if that works, because that would be cool. So we're back over here. I'm going to deploy. Um, this is the server manager. Again, kubectl apply. Oops, I didn't deploy Redis. Uh, it's going to go slow. All right, let's fire that up real quick. That's going to take a couple of seconds to come in because they'll they'll retry until it comes back up. Um, where's my mouse? There we go. Oh, there we go. Cool, we're up. Sweet. So that's all coming up. I need to deploy a service. This is basically exactly the same thing. Now this is um, both of these things, like the the session manager and stuff, is like five hundred lines of Go code. It's nothing very special. Um, there's all sorts of interesting, fun stuff that exists in the Kubernetes library to let you do all sorts of fun things, but the basic gist of this code is nothing particularly complicated. Uh, I'm actually going to have a look at my deployments and see whether that's come up, because uh, this is, again, nice stuff here. So we're looking at a deployments here. I just wanted to have a look, because I fired up Redis in the wrong order, <laughs> uh, which is fine. This is actually all set up so that it'll retry uh, if something fails. Um, so we've got sessions, we've got two available, cool. All right, that's all, that's fine, as long as I've got a couple up. Um, one of the nice things inside Kubernetes as well is it's got a whole concept of like health checks and readiness checks. So if something's not available or something needs to be restarted, there's ways you can do that either through HTTP or a variety of other ways as well. So uh, eventually these have like, um, they have a back off retry already built into them. So. They'll, they'll come online eventually, but that's all hooked up and ready to go. All right, sweet. So if that's ready, which it is, I'm going to get services. And here are a bunch of services here, but the only public one I have is this matchmaker, which is right here. So let's grab that. So let's grab that. And then if I come over here and I don't care about that. All right, let's see if this works. This is where things go wrong. Hopefully not. All right, so we're going to start up the game. All right. Uh, we make sure it starts up over here. Uh, it's nice and small. Thank you, Unity, for giving me this thing. All right, beautiful. That's there. Oh, it's got, it's got my mouse trapped. All right, cool. That seems to be is it doing the things I want. Yes, it's polling. All right, cool. I'm going to send that to a different window. Well, it's going while well, that's waiting for another player to join. All right, so I'll plug this in there. All right, let's run that. Put that on this display. Awesome. So what should happen is this is going to connect to um, the matchmaker. It should then ask Kubernetes, uh, the, uh, the, the server manager, to say, hey, I need a new instance. Oh, there we go. Sweet. It's going to create a new instance on that machine, and the ball will drop. And whoop. Right, like I said, the... Uh, but if I have a look, I am playing a game over the internet while I'm at a conference. It's a terrible game. Um, oop, I have no battery left. <gasps> that would be awfully embarrassing. Good thing I saw that. 
this now. Is there a power strip down here somewhere? Is there power power down here? My laptop's about to die. Actually, it's fine. That's what external batteries are for. There we go. Totally. <laughs> We're having fun today. All right, sweet. So we have a game, and it's playing awesome. Awesome. So I'm actually going to kill that because that is going to drain my battery. Uh, what did I do with it? There we go. I'm going to kill that too. Sweet. So that all worked. Um, and if we actually want to have a look over here, there's our little game server here as well. Whee! And we can see some details of it. Awesome. So how are we doing? Cool. We got 20 minutes. Um, yeah, we got time. We got time. So this is pretty cool. Um, we can basically take advantage of some really cool stuff inside Kubernetes and Docker to build a system that lets us scale out over large clusters. Um, and we can spread these clusters around the world too if we want to. But let's take it one step further. Let's auto scale. Um, so this is, this is sort of the, the big thing that we want to be able to do as well so that uh, especially when we're running Kubernetes in the cloud, right? we want to basically only pay for the resources we need. Um, if you're running this on your own hardware, you might just be like, cool, I have a massive Kubernetes cluster. And it's as big as it's ever going to get, and that's fine, so I don't care. Um, and I'll just run stuff on it. Who cares? But if I'm running in the cloud, um, you definitely want to scale it up and down so that you only pay for what you need. So there's a couple of things we can definitely do to make this happen, and some code we can write to make this happen, too. So the first thing we actually want to do is put some constraints on the memory and CPU usage that we have on our game servers. Right? So we need to know how much CPU and memory each game server uses, and so we can actually determine how many of these can fit in any given machine and do all that kind of annoying, boring load testing like that you can't get away from. But the lovely thing is, uh, this is a screenshot here of the Kubernetes UI, where it actually shows me nice pretty graphs of my CPU and memory usage. Uh, so I ran this a bunch of times, <coughs> excuse me, I ran this a bunch of times and um, I ended up, it ended up being about 0 0.08, 0 0.09 of a CPU was that little Unity server was ended up using. So I thought, all right, cool, we'll put it at 0.1 of a CPU. That seems like a good little buffer. Uh, and for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to use CPU for um, scaling metrics, and I'm not going to worry too much about memory because it's not using anything and I don't care. Um, so what I can actually do, which is quite nice, is um, I can say here on my pod definition, hey, you only get 0.1 of a CPU. This means I can run a whole bunch of these dedicated game servers, and when, if one of them goes a little weird and somehow gets into some sort of infinite loop or whatever, it doesn't impact the rest of my machines. This is just a nice ability of having containers, and they have the, the capability of doing that kind of stuff. But it also gives me a really nice metric to do um, all my auto-scaling for. We build like our own little custom auto-scaler, because Kubernetes, I can introspect it and say, hey, let's look at all your nodes, and then let's look at how much CPU cores you have on there. And if I know the math, that I want to do and I know like the machines that I'm on, then all I'm doing is kind of doing math. I'm like, how many of these can fit in a machine? And then how do I want to auto scale from there? Um, so I implemented a really simple scaling solution with my code. And this is all up on GitHub, uh, which is basically scaling with a buffer. So I make sure there's always room for n number of, um, n number of, of instances. And so when they're coming up, they're fine. As we add more and more, we don't do anything else special. But as soon as we cross over that buffer, I turn around to Kubernetes. Um, and in this case, I talk to APIs on the Google Cloud side, but you could do it on any other cloud provider uh, to say, hey, give me another node. Um, and then you can sort of just play with numbers on that, depending on how long it takes to fire up a new node and get that stuff. On us, it takes about three minutes to create and, and add another new GKE node, uh, a, new, a new Kubernetes node. And from there, we can just continue. So to speak. So um, I have this thing called a node scaler. It's a, another little bit of code. I think it's probably about a thousand lines of Go code. Most of it is doing math and just talking to um, our APIs. Uh, I just want one of it because having more than one scaler up at once would be race conditions and that would be bad. And then I just pass in some environment variables about how it should work. That's really it. Um, let's see if I've got this set up right. I believe I do. 
So let's see if we can, what is the cluster? We've got 15 minutes, perfect. All right, so I'm just gonna have a look at our nodes. It should be set up right. Internet, there we go. Okay, so right now there is a split and we'll talk a little bit about it later, but these are our game servers here. So we can see we only have one of them. Actually, why don't we do this? We'll say grab game. There we go, that's easier. All right, uh, make deploy RS. So that's gonna send that up. And what we're gonna do actually, which is quite nice as well, we'll kubectl, um, there's a bunch of stuff that's built in. So if I wanna um, tail the logs of my node scaler, um, I can do this generally, you'll actually set up a thing that does uh, log aggregation. There's a lot of uh, options for doing that. If you run on us, we do it for free. Um, but you can do it with Elasticsearch and a whole bunch of other things. Um, here is just an easy way of me saying, just tail all the stuff that, um, what should we call it? Uh, where are we? The sugar. Tail all the, all the logs that come out of this pod, and it just makes it really easy for me to get access to them. Um, I've got a little thing here that, uh, SVC, SVC is just the shorthand. Uh, I've got a little thing that sets up fake games. So why don't we get that running? Um, line me out of the make file. Yeah. Export server. I'm just going to tell it that that's the server. Beautiful. Test join. Actually, we'll do two of them because that'll be two players. So. All right, so here you'll see uh, some fun stuff happening. So here we'll see that there's a bunch available. Like it's telling me like I have 0.1 of a CPU. I have 36 free because I have a four node cluster. Uh, requires a buffer of 10. Oh, I should really push that up beforehand. That's all right, we'll make a whole bunch of these. We'll make a whole bunch. Um, here we go. And we'll see that number slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah, come on. We'll just we'll push that all the way down. Come on, come on, come on. But this is just um, what's cool about this, and I'll, actually this is what I, I should mention as well. So while I'm doing this, is the way this works is it has access to Kubernetes APIs that enables me to watch whenever things happen to pods. I can actually watch just about anything inside Kubernetes. Um, that I don't need to build myself. I don't need to build these process management tools. I don't need to build the things that watch the things that are changing. Those things already exist. So it's actually a really simple thing for me to say, okay, whenever a pod gets created or deleted, check to see if we have enough buffer and then do the work that needs to happen to make sure that thing happens. So here we go, we're at 10. Um, I just wanna kick this over slowly. All right, now it should kick over. All right, cool. So now it's gonna be like, all right, now I've run out of buffer. I need to increase this to a size of two. That's gonna take a couple of minutes. So I'm gonna distract you with some other things while that's happening in the background. So one thing that we just, we touched on very briefly. So you may have noticed when I had a look at the nodes, there were some called apps and some called uh, games. Uh, one of the things we can also do inside Kubernetes uh, is basically heterogeneous clusters. So we can do clusters that have different capabilities and different hardware that they run on. Uh, so in this particular instance, I'm just running like one CPU nodes for my apps because they're just, they don't do very much. They're actually pretty low CPU necessity, but I can keep them cordoned off from all my game server stuff. I can have very dedicated machines. Like these are the machines that dedicated game servers run on. So if my apps do something weird, or I just don't want them taking that extra resources, I have that little bit of extra segregation in terms of one thing going next to another, which is really nice. Um, and then I can also say like, the really big expensive beefy machines, I wanna make sure that, you know, that's the thing that really um, gets taken advantage of when I'm doing stuff uh, for my dedicated game servers. There's like two or three different ways of doing it because this is changing a little, but the, the easy way is when we specify our pod, we have a node selector. Again, key value attributes, right? So we can have a role on our nodes, just like we can have a, a key value attribute on anything else. And I'm just saying role game server, that's where they end up. So that makes things super easy and gives us a nice amount of control over what's going on. All right, let's see if that's worked. I don't know, let's, uh, what are we, five? Yay, all right, so kubectl. Nice. Grab game. Beautiful. And now we have two. Yay. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about scaling down, but we can. Um, I've got a blog post I need to write about that, but we can talk about that if people want to do that. There's, um, oh, just very briefly, actually, I will say um, you have abilities inside Kubernetes to cordon nodes. Uh, basically, it means make them unschedulable. So you can shut those down. You can basically leave them running and say, make sure if any new thing comes up, it doesn't end up on this particular node. Um, so then you can do fun stuff where you're just like, all right, uh, if I have too much buffer, I will cordon this so nothing gets scheduled on it. And then I can say when that finally empties, then I'll shut it down and get rid of it. And then you can scale down and it works quite nicely. Cool. Almost end of the day. So what did we, what did we actually do today? Um, so we took our dedicated game server along with some other software as well. Um, and we stuck it inside a container. Um, and this was pretty cool because the amount of code that we needed to write to do all of that kind of stuff probably all wrapped up maybe maybe 2,000 lines of code, maybe, maybe, probably not even, maybe 1,500. Um, most of that was probably the node scaler uh, and the matchmaker. Um, actually, the matchmaker is really simple. Um, but it was really simple stuff. And this is go to, so it's kind of verbose. Um, but because we have this beautiful abstraction of containers, uh, we're able to take something like Kubernetes and apply that over the top because it's a generic solution to just very common stuff that we all have to do. Um, and we can apply it to dedicated game servers just as nicely as we can to just about anything else. And then when we want to scale, right, we can take Kubernetes and apply that over anywhere from like two or three nodes to 5,000 if you want. Um, and then able to control these through APIs and through YAML files to really dictate exactly what it is that happens across all of these machines and really have very fine grained control over the processes that happen and do all that sort of fun stuff, which is super cool. Uh, what else could we be possible? Some of this we actually talked about. Um, scaling up our cluster with load, we talked about that. Scaling down with coordinating, so making things unschedulable. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in there uh, that we can do to avoid fragmentation. So we may not necessarily want to have too many, you know, one in here, one there, one here, one there. Uh, we can make it so they all group together. Um, there's a whole bunch of work around running uh, federating. We used to call it federating. I think they now call it multi-cluster. Uh, how to coordinate Kubernetes, multiple Kubernetes clusters happening around the world. You could do stuff like worm pools of game servers, math to predict cluster size, all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, if this sounded vaguely interesting and you want to learn more, um, the one place to go to to have a look, um, if you go to my GitHub account, Paddle Soccer, there's the first three of a uh, five part blog series that I've written um, all around this stuff and goes into even more detail than I have today. Um, I need to write the scaling down one and the multiple cluster one. Um, you can either read that on my blog or you can read it on Gamma Sutra, where apparently it just looks better and sounds better because it's on Gamma Sutra. <laughs> but it's just a reblog, really. Um, if you found me at all vaguely entertaining, uh, I do a weekly podcast, uh, the Google Cloud Platform podcast, where we talk about, um, we've talked about Kubernetes in the past. We've had the, um, whatchamacallit, we've had the director of engineering from Nianticon talking about Pokemon Go and how they were on Kubernetes and how that works. Uh, we've had some smaller studios, uh, po uh, Pocket Gems on, uh, Phoenix One Games on. Uh, we had Humble Bundle on, which I didn't know until a while ago was they run on us. Who knew? Um, so that's also interesting. Uh, if you're interested in Kubernetes, Kubernetes.io has great tutorials. Some of them are interactive. We just released this amazing new comic um, on, actually it's on the container engine, it's on our thing, that has an interactive tutorial where you can actually go in, like you read the comic and then it puts you in a tutorial. It's really sweet. Um, and while this sounds salesy, but it really isn't, one of the easiest ways of getting started with Kubernetes is even if you don't stay with us, uh, we give you a trial, go in, click a button and be like, I'd like a three node cluster means you can try out Kubernetes, decide if you like it, if the workflow is good. And then if you're like happy with that, then you could always decide if there's the pain or impetus to set up a cluster maybe somewhere else um, that's got maybe less of an automated workflow or possibly a scripted workflow. Um, without that, okay, cool. We've got like five, seven minutes for any questions that happen to exist. We have this one mic and you're all sitting together. Pass it to you. In case we have any questions. Uh, well, I do have a question, actually. Oh, good. There we go. That worked um, out perfectly. At the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that uh, MMO servers are slightly different to yes. um, these uh, servers that need to um, that these game servers that you were presenting. Yep. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So the basic. So yeah, as you said, like MMO services. So the basic tech behind this would still work for an MMO. How you would scale it and how you would spin them up and down would just be a very different strategy. 
um, depending on how is your game built and that kind of stuff. Um, you may keep them persistent. Like you may be like, all right, this is my geographic region and I've split it up this way. So I have these all set up warm and then people come in and out or, um, and then you may layer them as you add more people into other stuff, depending on how your stuff scales. Um, you wouldn't necessarily always like six people come together for a game, start a server, they all disappear and you probably kill it. Um, and then do that all over again. Um, and then you just, you're just picking your strategy on how you want to bring them up and down, depending on where your players are. Um, you might be like, oh, people are getting close to here, so we'll spin up some more servers around them. And then like everyone leaves in a, a region, so you kill them, and then you can spin up some more for wherever it is that they're going, that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, it just, yeah, it just depends on that. It's just, it just becomes a different strategy on how you want to do it. No? No? We're good? We're good? Well, thank you. Like I said, stickers are there. Business card's there. I appreciate the four of you taking the time um, and hanging out with me today. I'll be around the whole conference. So if you have any other further questions, please feel free to ping me. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it.